you all for giving up your time to come and come and see my presentation today. Uh, as Hugo said, I'm now working for the Nature Conservancy, so this presentation is going to be a bit more focused on the application of tools as opposed to extending theory, um, as most of us do during our PhDs. Um, so specifically, I want to talk about the project I've been leading since, uh, since starting at TNC. Um, I'm really excited about this work and I hope you enjoy it. It's looking at the application of eco-labelling instruments to small-scale sea cucumber fisheries uh, in Papua New Guinea. So the theory behind eco-labelling is really very simple. It's a market-based instrument, so it looks at uh, affecting uh, behaviour and trying to encourage better management using market signals rather than your more regulatory conventional management tools. So in the case of uh, eco-labelling or, or sustainable certification is another word for it, um, they look at limiting access to premium markets. And so using this, this illustration here um, up on the slide, you can see the, fish, uh, the fishery on the left is more of a business as usual conventional kind of fishery. Uh, operators will catch fish, sell it onto the market. The theory behind eco-labelling or sustainable certification is that with this fishery on the right, um, if that fishery or the fisheries manager puts a number of uh, management measures into play so that that fishery can be sustainably certified, then that may limit the catch from that fishery. The theory goes that the uh, market will be willing to pay more for that sustainable product. And that should somehow reimburse the fishers for the loss they get from that reduced catch. So as I said, I want to talk about the application of this instrument. So I'm not going to delve deeply into the theory uh, behind market-based instruments or eco-labeling here. Uh, there's just two things I do want to point out though. And the first one is that eco-labels, uh, when applied, are supposed to support conventional management. They're not a replacement for regulation. And the second one is that in that support role, they're supposed to have a greater impact if they're supporting a fishery where the enforcement capability for that regulation is weak. So it's not to say they can't work in fisheries with enforcement capability. There's just a point where, where they're not really helping that much anyway. And the reason I bring that up is because if you look at the Marine Stewardship Council, they're, they're very proud of the work they do. They have expanded a lot in the 20 or so years that they've been operating. And now uh, in 2015, they say that they've managed to cover 12% of the uh, marine global marine fish catch by weight. 12% goes through a fishery that has an MSC certification. So that's a great, uh, a great outcome for MSC. But if you dig down a little deeper, you can see that it's really, the coverage is really geographically patchy. And more than that, it's dominated by large industrial fisheries. So in the case of the, uh, the Northern Pacific, they get about 80% of coverage of these large industrial fleets. But if you look at small scale fisheries in developing countries through the tropics, the coverage is actually far under 1%. So going back to the point that these are gonna be most helpful in fisheries with poor enforcement capability, you can see the problem here. They're almost absent where they're needed most. So fortunately, a number of smaller certification or eco-labeling uh, organizations have sort of sprung up to try to fill this gap. They recognize that the barriers to entry into MSC certification are simply too high for small-scale fisheries. And so uh, one example of this is the World uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature's um, Sustainable Seafood Network. And so they've tried to bring certification costs down, which is one of the major barriers. But the second major barrier is that with MSC certification, the time lag between actually uh, taking the, the, the cost of certification, so that's with in, increased management, uh, and increased monitoring, all those sorts of things, there's often many years before, or at least a couple of years, before you'll see any benefits by inclusion in those, those premium fisheries. So one of the ways that the WWF uh, Sustainable Seafood Network tries to tackle this is that instead of using that binary approach of certified or uncertified that MSC employs, they use a traffic light system. 
So you've got your recommended fish in green, the fish somewhere in the middle in the, in the yellow, and then the fish to absolutely avoid in red. The reason that this helps to break down that barrier to entry is that small scale fisheries can actually access the sustainable seafood network even if they just have that yellow rating. And they can get that yellow rating by showing management plans that show promise as well as some history of good management. And that doesn't have to be for the same fishery. If the same management body can show that they've managed another fishery well and they have plans to manage this one, they can get a foot in the door. And so then they can start seeing the benefits as they start incurring the costs of improving that management, hopefully in a short term undergoing another uh, re reassessment for certification. And if that management works, they can move up. If it doesn't work, of course, they're excluded from the network and it, and it failed. So at TNC, we were interested in whether we could apply this eco-labeling instrument to small-scale beach demir or, or sea cucumber fisheries in the, tropical, uh, in, in the tropics. And we were interested in this because if you look at the, the map over here on the left, you can see in the tropical band, most of those fisheries are red or orange, so overexploited or depleted. There's a few exceptions to that, but the majority are in that, in that stage. And if you look at the history of those individual fisheries, a lot of them are following what is so-called uh, the boom-bust ban cycle. And so over here on the top, uh, this graph, if you, if you look at the trajectory of that, that uh, green line, you can see that cycle in action. If you go from the peak of that, uh, that green spot up there, then the dotted line follows after the fishery is opened, there's a boom of unsustainable, poorly regulated fishing and it drives the population down. If enforcement isn't strong enough to put in any regulation to sort of stop that decline, then often the last resort is to ban the fisheries operation entirely. Uh, if, if that ban comes in in time, then you're going to see the green line to pick back up again as the fishery can start to recover slowly from that, that unsustainable fishing pressure. So um, obviously this is, this is economically inefficient, but the other real danger of this style of fishing is on the graph on the bottom there, you can see if the population crashes too far, if the ban isn't placed quick enough, then you can see the Ali effect start to come into play and that population will continue to decline even after a ban's put in place. So it is not a great way to fish economically or environmentally. And if we look at my area of interest, which is Papua New Guinea, look at their fishery, it's a great example of this. Basically, they had poorly regulated fishing, highly unsustainable levels of fishing up to 2009, and it absolutely crashed the, uh, the population. The National Fisheries Authority stepped in at that point and put a complete ban nationwide on fishing beach to and so for those of you unfamiliar with this fishery, that's a really big deal for coastal communities in Papua New Guinea. This is the most important fishery to everyday people in Papua New Guinea. It's the second biggest fishery in the country in terms of income, the first being tuna. But while tuna is, is captured by large companies and, and with, some, with some revenue given to government, there's really high participation in this fishery. Over 200,000 people are involved, arti small artisanal fish uh, fishers, and uh, it's estimated that around 30% of rural co coastal income came from this fishery alone before it was banned in 2009. So it was obviously a big deal. Um, thank goodness the National Fisheries Authority did close it, and not only that, I've got to give credit where it's due, they withstood incredible political pressure to reopen it uh, as, as the years went on. They managed to keep it closed for eight years, at which point their ongoing monitoring suggested that it was at a level that they were, they were uh, willing to open it again. So in 2017, that's just what they did. They reopened the fishery, um, this time under a new Beach Demir National Fisheries Management Plan. And this new plan put, uh, put some regulatory instruments in place. So you've got seasonal closures for six months of the year, you've got provincial total allowable catch quotas, uh, which are provincial, and if, if, if those quotas are hit, then the closure will come into place before the, uh, the fishery would otherwise be shut, and uh, species-specific size limits. 
So the bad news is that some of these tools were used before and did nothing. And the enforcement capability at the national level is pretty much the same as it was. Um, the, the National Fisheries Authority certainly does what they can, but uh, it's difficult. The fishery is very widespread, as I said, and they, they're not very well funded to, to carry, out their, carry out their mandate. So as a way of, or, or in recognition of this weak enforcement, they, in the new management plan, they devolved management responsibility to community or local levels. Uh, which, which could be seen as more cynically as just sort of handballing down the road. They can't deal with it. Maybe the communities will be able to deal with it. Luckily in Papua New Guinea, there is some strong management capability at the community level through customary governance. Unluckily, however, there's really very little incentive for local governance structures to put additional restrictions on something that's so important for fishers' livelihoods. It's gonna cause problems in the community and their payoff is just too uncertain. They can't see a reason to do it. So we looked at that fishery and saw that as being an opportunity. You've got the regulatory structure that you need for the eco-labeling to support. You've got weak enforcement. Now you just need a strong community partner to deal with. So uh, as I said, this is about the application of, of, this, uh, of this instrument. And as we applied it, we were really interested in looking at two major questions. And that's first, the economics. Can the direct export of eco-label beach demir actually provide the financial incentive that we need if we're gonna ask people to take a management hit based on that? And secondly, of course, is whether those financial incentives, if they exist, are gonna actually lead on to any better management in the water. So before I go into how we uh, looked at those questions and how the, how the project sort of panned out, as I said, we need a strong community partner, a local partner. Uh, we chose to do this work in Southern Manus uh, with a, a long-term partner of, of TNC there. Uh, they've been working with us for more than 15 years. Um, they, they have a large area. This is, this is relatively, uh, well, this is very large area for, for a community-based organization to be managing in Papua New Guinea. It's a two and a half million hectare seascape um, and they cover or, or, or represent 10,000 artisanal fishers and their families. As well as that, uh, through ongoing work over the last uh, decades, they've really strengthened their customary management. They've proven themselves on a number of different things, including managing these big group of spawning aggregations. So we knew that they had some teeth when it came to management locally. And largely they did have, they have a very strong marine resource focus, particularly. They're, they're, they come from a long, long line of fishes and the marine resources are really all they have. They have very little land. So they really wanted to get this right. As, as a bit of an interesting aside, um, the centre here actually has a history with this, with this mob as well because Dr. Glenn Almany went over there and performed some of his research looking at the larval, distrib uh, sorry, larval dispersal distances of grouper, of, of locally important grouper here, um, and that research showed that these individual council of chief areas that you can see within that larger MENA area, that's the level that, you, that, that everything used to be managed at. And when he looked at his larval dispersal distances, he communicated back to the communities that actually it would be far more efficient, far more effective if they managed this at a larger area. And that was actually the main catalyst of this group forming into a larger MENA cooperative. So that's a really cool example of how centre science can actually lead to real outcomes on the ground. Okay, so I just want to kind of step through the, the process that, uh, as it went for, for this project. Um, I apologise if that's too small to, to read. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll walk through it pretty simply. But basically you have the end of 2016 on the left all the way up to uh, the start of 2018 on the right. And before we could support MENA, which was the, the local cooperative that we're working with, to export Beach Demir, we needed to, uh, they, oh sorry, they needed to incorporate as a cooperative society and also register a, be a business arm. And that's because they wanted to directly export um, out of the country. So th after they fulfil fulfilled that requirement, we looked at assisting them getting 
a sustainability rating for their sea cucumber fishery. So although they harvest or they target around 22 species in this area, they chose to focus on just two to get a sustainability rating. Unfortunately, these, uh, the, these systems don't really work very well with multi-species fisheries. They're not, they're not set up for it. And so it had to be species by species, the, the, um, the certification. So there's a really good reason, or there's a number of good reasons why these two species were chosen. Uh, the primary one being that these are by far the highest two value species in Papua New Guinea that are targeted. Um, secondly, and I think as importantly, we realized from background research that these are the only two species that are targeted here that are locally consumed in Hong Kong. And from reading, we felt that there was a much greater chance that we were going to be able to find a, a premium market or a market that was willing to pay a premium for sustainable product in Hong Kong than we were uh, in southern China where, where the rest are shipped to or Southeast Asia. So that's why they were focused on. Um, as I said, obviously, there's some management that has to come underneath this before they're able to be certified. Uh, these two these two species were given a yellow rating or an orange rating, sorry. So that gained them access to that sustainable seafood network. But I'm going to circle back around and come to the management uh, in a little bit. So I won't go into that right now. So once they had their certification, uh, TNC then supported Menar to obtain an export license from the National Fisheries Authority. One of the measures that the NFA uses to manage this, this, uh, this fishery is to have bonded, uh, limited bonded exporters. So you have to put 50,000 uh, Papua New Guinea and Kina, which is what, 12,000 or something US dollars. Um, and they hold that for five years. So if you're gonna break any of their rules, if they enforce those rules, they've got you a little bit. So we had to support Menar to obtain that license financially and also sort of uh, logistically. And then uh, TNC also provided about 170,000 US dollars as startup funding. And that's to purchase the product, to set up processing um, and to export that product. So using this funding, um, Menar began to, to purchase product in April. And once they had uh, some finished product ready to, ready to show, sort of some good sample product, I then took a delegation from Mena, these guys down the bottom, uh, over to Hong Kong and we met with a bunch of wholesalers over there. So another enabling factor in this is TNC has a good presence in Hong Kong. We have an office there and good links with WWF and they were able to push us towards some of the people in that sustainability or that sustainable seafood network. So while in Hong Kong, we met with uh, eight potential buyers. Of those eight, only two were interested in paying a premium or were willing to pay a premium for sustainable product. Uh, in, in chatting with these, these two wholesalers, we found that the reason for that is that they're exclusively their customers are these large international hotel and restaurant chains. And so this is really interesting because some background research had suggested that Chinese consumers are far less interested in paying a premium for sustainability. They're interested in quality, uh, they're interested in health benefits, a whole, a whole bunch of things, but sustainability ranks pretty low. And that was cool because some theoretical work had pointed to the fact that actually, you don't necessarily need consumers pushing this sustainable uh, eco-labeling movement. You can have a strong middle uh, person in the middle of the chain, and that was these large international companies with corporate social responsibility policies so they had a mandate to purchase sustainable seafood, whether or not their consumers were or their customers were asking for it. So that was cool because otherwise it would have, uh, it would have all fallen over. So we were glad that happened. Um, and Menar secured a uh, sale uh, agreement with, with one of these wholesalers and went back and continued operations on the ground in Manus. So over the operation of the 2017 uh, Beach Demir open season, they were able to purchase and process 1.8 tons of this high, these two high value species. They then shipped those to Hong Kong um, and from the proceeds of those sales, they were able to, at the start of this year, fully reimburse all of the startup funding that TNC put in. 
So this is really important because I want to differentiate here between a model of having to, to uh, constantly support this fishery and what we were trying to set up here. And that is something that once it's running, the hope is that it can basically continue turning over and, and, and stand on its own two feet. So these are the, uh, the, the economic results after the fishery uh, finished for the year. So what we have here in the three columns, so these are returns to members of the Menar Cooperative or the community members within that cooperative. The column on the left is our estimation of what they would have gained by following the business as usual model, by not employing any of these techniques. And we calculated that by looking at the export, export tonnage that they had, by uh, not incorporating any of the additional costs that they gained through running this business, and just multiplying it by the best price that they could have gained by selling to any of the other buyers around Manus. So it came out at about around $70,000 is what they would have got just from selling this product. However, the column on the far uh, right is what they actually gained in 2017. And so you can see it's a huge, huge uh, increase. They got about two and a half times what they would have just by running that business as usual. Um, most of that, that benefit went straight back to fishers through paying a much higher premium price for the product at the point of purchase. The original intention was to pay about a 20% premium. Unfortunately, because they were buying partially processed product because they wanted to uh, do the final processing to make sure they had consistency of quality, um, the product wasn't completely dry and they didn't properly calculate how much weight they'd lose uh, from that. So that's something they're going to address later. But you can see still that money goes straight back to, back to the community. The only change will be that yellow bar will go down and their profit will go up if they can fix that. So they still managed to make about an $11,000, uh, sorry, 11,000 US dollar uh, profit at the end. There's also a bond that sits with the NFA, as I mentioned, that they'll get back if they, uh, if they don't break any of those, any of those regulations and some, uh, some small amount for wages for employees that are, buying the stock and, and processing the stock in the, in the centre at Loringau. Um, the middle bar here is our best estimate that we could get of if they directly exported the sea cucumber, but they didn't seek that sustainability rating. And so it's important to note that these, these numbers are not necessarily very representative because it's really hard to get pricing information out of, it, out of businessmen. You can't just survey them like you, can, like you can others, right? That's very important information that they hold pretty close. So this is just calculated by the best offer that was given by one of the wholesalers in Hong Kong that didn't care about sustainability. So you can see there's actually, as, as, a, as a development tool, there's actually a benefit to be gained just by looking at cooperatives exporting this stuff directly rather than dealing with all the middlemen in the middle. But uh, I suppose fortuitously as well as that, or, or, or gratefully as well as that, there's still a large premium to come on top just from that sustainability certification. So that's important to, to us as, as fisheries managers and as conservationists rather than a, a, as people working in development. So we can say pretty clearly that the direct export model of, of sustainable sea cucumber uh, provided a, a really strong economic incentive to, um, to employ this, this eco-labeling technique. The next question, and the one that's really important to us as, as fisheries scientists, fisheries managers, is whether those financial incentives lead to better management. So I promise I'd circle around and give a little more information on the, uh, on the management that was employed in MENAR. This here is a close-up of, again, that's the MENAR area on the left, and this here on the right is a close-up of one of those council of chief areas. It's a bit hard to make out here, but there is a number of small small MPAs that are set up there. And those MPAs were set up specifically to look at sea cucumber stock management. And the way that they went about this process is we used a participatory process, basically during the tribal council meeting, got some of the best beach to fishers together and asked them to delineate on a map where the highest densities of these species are found. But then, we're aware that the real problem here is going to come from enforcement. And so, as, as Hugo said, these are basically gold bars sitting in the bottom of the ocean. For, the, for these guys, this is a really important... Uh, it's, 
it's a really tempting stock to poach. And so we wanted to make sure that the chance at enforcement was maximized. So we took that area that was delineated as great habitat, and then we took a subset of it where community members that were uh, reported as having the cultural and political clout to actually enforce those areas, we made sure that those, those, uh, those managed areas were in direct line of sight of their household. The idea being that they can see if anything happens, they can enforce if anything happens. So I should, should just quickly say, as well as that they put a lot of effort into, or at least that they, they uh, demonstrated that they really wanted to enforce the national level laws as well. And so the size limits, we know anecdotally, are really poorly enforced at the point of export. Men are committed to strongly enforcing the size limit at the point of sale, and also to fine any community members that brought undersized product in. Okay, so very quickly, um, the, the technique that we use to, uh, to evaluate the management success here is we surveyed for density of sea cucumbers within the MPAs that were set aside by the communities, as well as openly fished areas within three MENAR communities. And then as a control, we looked at, uh, at two communities outside of MENAR borders. Unfortunately, only one of those control communities had an MPA, um, so, so that data is fairly limited. It's down to one community. Um, this survey was carried out a month before the fishery opened and then two months after the fishery closed to give us some sort of timeline and to look at the trajectory that happened over that fishery. So here are the results. On the left of that dashed line are the two communities outside of Menar. On the right are the three communities inside of Menar. These results are limited to, we've got data on all sea cucumber species that we looked at, but this is just the sandfish. And I'm showing you this data because firstly, that was one of the two target species. So we felt it would tell the story better. And secondly, this is like the canary in the coal mine. It's all shallow water distribution. It's high value. This is usually the species that drops first. So we figured if you can, if you can conserve this guy, you can conserve the rest. So there's a few things that I take out of this. Oh, firstly, just, just to explain what's actually going on in these graphs. In each individual graph, you've got uh, the box and whiskers showing the density of sandfish within the MPA before the fishery, after the fishery. In the openly fished area, before the fishery in black, and after the fishery in black. Okay, so there's a few things to take out of this, uh, these graphs here. The first one is that we didn't get a good control. Over here, the, the, the communities outside of Menar had very low densities of, uh, of sea cucumbers, or at least of sandfish. And there's, there's a whole number of, of things that could come into play here that, you know, there could, there could be environmental um, explanations for this. But certainly anecdotally, we heard that these were already getting harvested as, it, it was a month before the fishery opened, but it takes about three weeks to process. People were already harvesting them and, and starting the process outside of Menard. So lesson learned, do you before survey four months before an expensive <laughs> survey, uh, uh, expensive fishery opens. Um, so that was the first thing. Secondly, uh, if you just look at the, the data inside MENAR before the fishery opened, you can see that these MPA densities are much higher. And that's a great testament to the fact that this participatory uh, planning process with lo using local ecological knowledge is really good. This is, if Bob Pressey was here, he'd be stoked. This is not residual research, uh, uh, MPA network. This is really targeting the, uh, the species of interest. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news, as I'm sure you can clearly see, is we've got some really strong, inside MENA, in the MPAs, we've got some really strong declines in two of the three MPAs. And obviously this is the crunch. This is the important thing here because this entire model, as we saw from the economics, is really, really strengthened by the fact that these are eco-label. So, um, so obviously also, if you look at the trajectory, there's not much time to turn that around before they look the same as the openly fished areas. So that's, that's really bad news. The slight uptick on that is in one of the three areas the MPAs work perfectly. 
This is actually the, uh, the home community of the executive director of MENA. So we know for a fact that he was pushing this model really hard. So that's one thing that could, could, uh, could, be, could be causing this difference. Of course, there's a number of other factors. And when we went back, we took these, um, these results back to MENA at their latest tribal council meeting at the start of this year. And we relayed the economic results and everyone was jubilant. And then we relayed these results and my boss, Rick, put them on notice and said, listen, you, if you can't turn this around, then you're lying to consumers and as a conservation NGO, we have to walk away with it, from it and you'll lose your sustainability rating, you'll lose your access to the market, the whole thing falls over. So you've got this season to prove that you can turn this, this model around. Um, as you can imagine, particularly because of the difference between communities, there was some pretty heated discussion after that. Um, I like to think they spent three days discussing how they were going to turn this around following that discussion. Um, I like to think that after that heated discussion, it kind of simmered down into something that was actually constructive and people started to pass back and forth the knowledge that they would need to share within the network of, okay, how did this one work? You were, you were handing out fines. Okay, how many fines were administered here? None or not enough. And they were passing this knowledge back and forth and really it's up to MENAR to fix MENAR's management. We are, the, the term that, that people sometimes use in, in TNC is, is you drive, we'll guide. We are not managing this resource, we are assisting them and, and trying to help them to do so. Okay, so back to our two questions. I think we can safely say that the direct export of, of Eco Label Beach Demir holds a great promise uh, economically as an incentive to help bring, bring about better management of this resource. This is great news. But the second question we saw, there was some limited management success, which makes me, which makes me very happy because, you know, this is PNG. And to get one of those MPAs working perfectly, I saw as a great success. Of course, the downside of that is that trajectory shows that they have a very limited time to get this right. And so I, I uh, see it as a plus, but there's a, watch this space because I'm hoping that in a couple of years I can come back and present how this whole thing turned around and everything, uh, and everything now this model is shown, but we will see. So thanks very much. That's, that, uh, that's, that's the project that I've been working on pretty much all the time for the last couple of years. Um, I just want to finish with a few steps going forward. As I said, we want to continue to try to help MENAR to improve their operations in Manus. The one that I touched on is they really need to get that management right. So that's where most of the energy is going because that's where it can really just fall over. Uh, as well as that, they're working on issues of, of making sure they get consistent product quality. Um, which, which, is, which is with feedback from the wholesaler, which has been really constructive. Um, and TNC is continuing to evaluate the fishery, um, pushing towards a, a reassessment um, in, in perhaps a year's time. So as well as that, what we're really interested in is whether this holds a promise as a model that can be replicated and expanded elsewhere. Um, as I said at the start of the talk, MENA is, there's some unique uh, capability within MENA. It's been a long-term partner of TNC. Uh, they control a fairly large area. There's a bunch of these sort of things. We've been monitoring everything that we can throughout to try to get an idea of what are these enabling factors and what are the factors that are really holding this back. And from those, we're looking at, at, at performing a bunch of sort of desktop um, feasibility studies to see where this this has a good chance of working, and then we'll go and, and hold some more in-depth sort of scoping studies to see if there's promise somewhere to try to roll this out. There's a lot of interest from, we've, we've taken this to NFA, uh, to the National Fisheries Authority in PNG, we've taken it to the Fisheries Authority in, our, in the Solomon Islands. Um, everyone's really excited by the model, but we're just kind of putting the brakes on a little bit and saying, if you, if you try to roll it out nationwide, you're gonna have a big failure and people are gonna throw it away. I think that we need to find it the next spot and then slowly actually learn Okay, what are these what are these uh, important factors that are that are making this work or not work? Okay, and the and the final point that I want to leave on is that we're we are committed to use the best science-based management based on based on the best science that we have available. 
And so as far as I'm concerned, that involves putting together what's already out there, but also trying to push forward some of the places that we know are holding us back. Um, so in terms of this particular project, I'm working closely with uh, Hugo Harrison, who, who uh, introduced me earlier, and he's kindly uh, lending his, his genetics expertise, of which we have none, um, to, to look at the larval connectivity uh, of sandfish, which is one of those two important species across that menar seascape. And so, of course, that will then help us to, to better design that MPA network based on the science. We're then looking at, at rolling that out for, uh, for the second species in a second location, um, but, but we'll get to that when, when it comes. Um, the second study that, that I'm interested in, in looking at is looking at some of the deep water species um, with, with ROV surveys. At the moment, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So the second species that they targeted, not the sandfish, but white teat, Holothuria uh, fusco gilva, we know that they have, uh, that they can reside in depths deeper than they're harvested within PNG. There's no deep water trawls for these species. It's all hand, hand picked. So the question is, is that deep water population going to be enough of a, a refugia of, of, uh, of stock that we can actually look at that at, uh, when we look at management and say there's a, there's a safety net there for that species. At the moment, we don't know. There's just no actual data for those. Um, okay, and so I'd end on just saying that's, that's the couple of projects that, that, uh, that we've dreamed up, but I'm really interested in hearing from anyone who has any suggestions on how this could be made better, uh, any suggestions on future research directions that they think would would kind of um, push back and help the model. Thanks very much.